I've spent the past eight months or so designing and building this Minecraft condo tower. My guidelines from the urban planners were to create an iconic tower as one of the tallest buildings in the city of Everton, including condos, a ground floor shop, and an underground parking garage. I'll explore the city to find some potential designs, sketch plans for the architecture, floor plans, and structure, and then spend way too long building and furnishing it in Minecraft. So today, I'll be bringing you along with me on my quest to complete a large skyscraper complex for once in my life. But for now, let's find out why I had to build a skyscraper in the first place. Once upon a time, there was a lumberjack named Alfred that lived in the northern forests of Everton. He cut down pine trees for a living to sell to the workers who would then use them to frame buildings in the city. After he cut down his trees, he would replant them. But this lumberjack had a secret technique when replanting to make his trees grow stronger than any other trees before them. One day he moved to the city to open his own shop, Alfred's Pine Emporium. The city of Everton bought up all of the pine they could get, the strongest pine ever known. Alfred got rich off this pine, but Alfred wanted more. So he set his sights high. He found an empty lot in downtown Everton and decided to build a skyscraper. But he was a lumberjack. He had no idea where to start. So he called up the only person that he could trust with his secret. Yeah, so basically Alfred just made me sign a non-disclosure agreement. Not sure why he chose me over any other architecture firm in the city. Maybe it's because we look alike. Now that I live in Vancouver, I figured the best first step was to go out, explore the city, and see what I could find. Go get some water, it's important. Get a bag, your notebook, and your pen. There's this new one under construction called the Butterfly. I thought it looked pretty neat, so I wanted to get a closer look. Okay, I'm going the right direction. It's somewhere down here. This is the back end of it. Ooh, yeah, okay, let's go down here and check it out. Rectangular base, and then the top is very much not. There's also an older building there. I don't know if you can see that. There's some old stonework. Now, usually I'd feel pretty guilty about having a square tower base and a rounded tower, but they do it here, so I don't feel as bad. I knew I still wanted to do something round on the bottom, so I went around the block to check out the other side. So you have this church which is maybe connected. I'll probably use the arches as inspiration, and then maybe I'll find something else instead of this pattern. And that's exactly what I did, but we'll get to that later. The idea with this floor plan is that you have four circular sections, so you have two on this side and two on the other side, but they're not exactly aligned. You have these two, put the other two back, and then shift them back a little bit. Of course, I needed to design the connector too, so I planned to use a similar curve. Now, if you're an architect, or at least a good one, you know one of the most important parts of building design is how people interact with your building, even if they never go inside. I'm talking about the streetscape. I walked around a bunch to get a feel for the area, the busyness, how people get around. But there's one detail that's really easy to miss, but it's one of the most important, rain protection. I decided to include overhead rain protection on the sidewalks around the tower, even though 99% of people walking around would never step foot inside. It's just part of being a good architect. I got back to my studio and decided it was time to sketch out a vision. Sketching out the lot with the north facing upwards, the lot is 67 across and 50 deep with the smaller side having a slight incline. On the north side, there's an existing building right up against the property line that's about one to two floors tall. Same idea on the west, but it's closer to nine to 10. There was some existing greenery, mostly in the form of trees, but I had permission from the city planner, Rainy, to remove them if needed. I figured the best place to have the entrance to the residential lobby was on the south side off to the left since it was furthest away from the busy intersection. Next, it was time for the bubble method. Every time I need to create a floor plan, I write down the name of the rooms inside circles, and if you need them to be physically connected by a door or a hallway, I draw a line. You don't need to build every room you have planned out, but write them down anyway, just in case. I then pulled out the old Legos for some reason, drew some walls that I did not follow at all, and added additional floors connected by stairs and elevators drawn in a different color. Finally, I sketched out the shape of the complex, also known professionally as massing. I only know these professional terms because of my degree, and if you're wondering if a degree in architectural engineering is right for you, join my email list and be notified when my paid video series comes out. It'll tell you all about what you can expect from the degree and where you can go in your career. 
All right, I think you know what time it is. It's time to start building. So to make this condo tower as realistic as possible, I delayed the project repeatedly by spending the entire budget on Timbits. But don't tell Alfred, because he's, um, well, you'll see. I threw down some acacia blocks here in Cubepack to design a wavy floor template. I was told the building couldn't be taller than 195 blocks, so I added a scale and measured it out. Using a diagonal line, I added the first circle with the radius of 11, making the edges tangent to the property line. After stacking it up, I cut out an arched window like the one we saw earlier. I spaced out the floor height and added a rough connector to the not-yet-existent second circle to be able to find where the wave pattern closes. With the magic of stairs, slabs, and trapdoors in cube pack, I was able to make a pretty decent wave. After adding the glass around the circumference offset by one, I stacked it up by two floors to see how it looked. I don't know about you, I think it looks pretty decent, but having that stacked up another 25 floors was going to look pretty repetitive, so I decided to switch it up. Instead of having the top and bottom equally spaced, every alternating floor would open and close on both sides. The real life building has the same gauge length, but shifts them so the peak of one floor is directly above or below the trough of the next. Next, I flipped and pasted the same circle connected by the arch. It ended up fitting perfectly within the lot, which technically means I'm a genius and better than everyone else. I had to take a minute to admire my brain power by walking around the neighborhood to see how it fit in. So far, so good. I added an arched connector and stacked it all the way to the top. At the very top, I cleaned it up and changed the top couple of floors to acacia planks to make it feel more complete. Behind this wall will be rooftop HVAC equipment, stairs, and elevator overruns. A few days later, I finally stopped procrastinating and shifted the building from being four circles centered around the middle point to the offset version like real life. Turns out, it only took about 10 minutes worth of work. Finally, it was time to design the structural systems holding this tower together. I used this thing called a shear wall, which is essentially the spine of the tower. It's where all the most important things are, like the four elevators, two emergency staircases, and in real life, mechanical and electrical equipment. When you design a shear wall, there's two important things to remember. First, if you're working with tall, thin towers, window space is everything. So don't waste your window space by having the shear wall up against the sides, keep it in the middle. Second, let's bring your dog into this. You live on the 28th floor and the fire alarm goes off. Now you need to get out. You go into the hallway and everything's on fire. Elevators automatically shut down during the fire alarm, so you'll need to take one of the two staircases. Unfortunately for you, the architect has the brain capacity of a hammer and put the entrances to both emergency staircases beside each other. Now, the only good news here is that you already named your dog Marshmallow. Put your entrances on opposite sides. It's not that hard. Next, I added grayscale flooring, walls, and the ceiling because I'm lazy and grayscale is pretty hard to mess up. So, to make it a little bit prettier, I added some green plants with orange pots. I then wrote out some engineering gibberish, which basically says, hey, let's make the building not fall over. After adding the circumference of structural columns, my challenge was to create floor plans that hid them inside partition walls rather than having them stick out. In total, I designed three units and mirrored them to make six per floor. There's two full circle units with two bedrooms and four half circle units with one bedroom each. One by one, I added wool markings and signs so I can tell where I want furniture, and then I replaced them. After I forgot to furnish a bathroom, I stacked it all the way up, but leaving the parapets up top to leave room for the rooftop equipment. Now, you can only get so much inspiration from one exploration, so I felt it was warranted to explore another Vancouver tower, this time down towards Stanley Park. So I see this building. This is a new building. It's not complete. I want to walk around the base because I walked by it earlier and it looked really cool. This one is called Alberni, named because it's on Alberni Street. It's pretty cool. On the back, it looks like someone took a block of clay and cut out a corner and the front has an incredible curve. But I'm here to check out the base. So it's definitely still under construction. I want to see if I can maybe sneak in this bottom part. Cool path going around here. These really interesting supports. I guess they are on a diagonal going up, so that does make sense. Back here, kind of this cool art. They also have this really cool rock. Wait, is it? Hold on. Okay, it is glass. I thought I was being tricked. I thought it was a mirror. So you got a big sidewalk here. You've got some shorter greenery along the front. You have your vents because there's a parking garage under there. Of course, you need ventilation. You have some bike racks on this corner. This is going down into the parking garage, I'm assuming. There's lots of greenery around, so I will do something similar. And then you have the courtyard down here. Really interesting. It feels like you're surrounded. It's a really interesting piece of art. Of course, down here you have the actual entrance to the building. Lots of cool mirrors. 
This is really cool. I can come all the way up here, have a seat. This is nice. You're almost a, a full floor above. You have two sections of columns. You have the diagonal and the vertical, and then they combine into one and continue diagonally up here. You have these connections going left to right, of course, for some of that lateral stability. That's pretty important. And then you have the big columns, which <laughs> are kind of hard to see. That right there, that's a column. You got one right here, got that one, and then you have two more down there. Okay, so I think that gives me a pretty good idea for what I want to do as a base. So let's go keep exploring. Big rock. Now that I had inspiration and a list, I explored the neighborhood to get a feel for how people interacted with their surroundings. There's a lot of interesting restaurants, some murals on older buildings, alleyways being the unsung hero of the city, plenty of lush trees courtesy of the rain, and people scurrying about their day. Call me Sergeant, because it's time to build the base. But not just any base. I wanted to keep the curved theme going, but let me tell you, it's a lot more difficult when the world is made of cubes. The idea was to make a wave-shaped overhang similar to the Alberni Tower. Oh boy, did I just make my life complicated. Here was the original idea, where at ground level, it would connect to the left-hand side at a 45 degree angle, rotate around some invisible center point until it hit the 45 degree mark on the other side, and then it would have an inflection point where it would perfectly align with the 56 block mark and attach to the other tower with a perfect tangent. Unfortunately, this is mathematically impossible. I quickly realized I could keep the left circle, but had to change the radius on the right. This time, the math was correct, but something else wasn't. I tried to build another impossible curve, got frustrated, ended up modeling it in Excel to get the X and Y coordinates for block placement, but surprise surprise, it didn't work. Still not realizing my mistake, I tried to change the entire thing into a sine wave. Once again, it didn't work. Then, I realized what was wrong. In my original sketch, the left circle for the ground curve and the right circle for the existing tower were aligned. Looking at the tower, they clearly shouldn't be. This drawing is showing the tower sticking out over the sidewalk by 12 blocks. So, to solve this problem, all I had to do was shift the right circle so the bottom was in line with the center of the left. Now, looking at the tower, it makes a lot more sense. I adjusted the formulas to account for the world being made of 1x1x1 one by one by one blocks, got my formulas, and then it took about 30 seconds. I outlined the walls, added structural columns and the lateral frame, added human-scaled lights over the sidewalk for pedestrians, finished the arch, planted some greenery, and started to build the back wall. Inside, my idea was to create a lobby with a front desk, places to sit, and a waiting area for the elevators. After making a basic layout, I finished the wall with a grayscale gradient going from a dark gray all the way into the same white used for the rest of the tower. It was slowly starting to take shape, but there was still a big problem to solve. I knew I wasn't going to be able to connect the tower facade all the way to the bottom without making some weird structure. I considered making it like New York Central Park Tower with the large cantilever, but this is a quarter of the tower we're talking about, and I could hear my structural engineering professor screaming at me all the way from Ottawa. So, like any realistic construction project, I didn't touch it for about two months. Not because of this problem, it's more due to my track record of never finishing 95% of my skyscraper bases. But I managed to guilt myself back into figuring it out, so I came up with whatever this is. Is it strong enough? Probably. Just keep in mind this structure isn't actually holding up the entire circle. In structural engineering, we use these things called tributary areas to figure out how much of a load each structural member has to hold. I didn't calculate anything because I'm not insane, but keep in mind a large portion of the load will be carried by the shear wall rather than this contraption. Next, I designed the eastern base. The design requirements included underground parking, so I created an entrance from the street. Additionally, according to the Building Code of Canada, at least one of your egress staircases must exit directly outdoors. So, I added a corridor leading outside. I proceeded to make some wacky design because I was exhausted, and used the bottom corner to create a shop called Alpine's Pine Emporium. No, not Alfred's. It belongs to me. While continuing to be exhausted and just wanting to get this thing done, I added rooftop HVAC with stair and elevator overruns, and then immediately got roasted with a request to change the east facade. To be fair, I did ask for a revision from the city planner, and it does kind of look like an exhaust vent. So, taking inspiration from the boxy tower base of Vancouver's tallest building, I created a light blue facade with horizontal slats to allow sunlight in when it's low in the sky, and block it during the middle of the day. By doing this, you get solar heat gains when you need them. One final touch was to make the flat bottom of the tower into a wave to create some distinct separation. One block, two blocks, a couple slabs, throw in some trapdoors, and would you look at that? After eight long months of brainstorming, iterating, exploring, building, and furnishing, I had finished the tower. 
but you wouldn't believe who wasn't there to see the final result. Guess where Alfred was? Not in Everton, could tell you that much. Turns out his super strength pine was just a hollowed out log filled with concrete. Even worse news, Everton had an earthquake during the construction and every single building using his super strength pine collapsed. So guess who got chased out of Everton and guess who's the new owner of this brand new skyscraper? This guy. The lumberjack named Alfred who escaped from Everton six months ago has been spotted in the mountains of India. If you see this man, do not approach and call 911 immediately. He is considered to be highly dangerous and does not-